All right, so what we're going to do is go through each one of these uh, sections. If I go a little bit too fast, then just hit pause, um, play it again, or write stuff down, take some notes. If you still have questions after this, then uh, please jot a note down somewhere and make sure that you come into class and ask me or your teacher if I'm not your teacher. All right, so here we go. Number one, how long should you rinse your eye if a chemical gets in them? At least 20 minutes. Why would wrapping somebody in a fire blanket help to extinguish a fire? Because in order to have fire, you need fuel, which would be the person or their clothing or hair or whatever, and you need oxygen. If the fire blanket reduces the amount of oxygen getting to the fuel, the fire will stop. You need to remember PASS when dealing with fire extinguishers. P stands for pull the pin. A stands for aim it at the base of the fire, not on the sides, at the base. S stands for squeeze the handle and S stands for sweep. You need to go back and forth, back and forth at the base of the fire in order to put it out. You never want to shoot right in the middle because if you do, this part of the fire is going to go that way, that part of, fire of the fire goes that way, and then you could end up with two fires instead of one. So P-A-S-S. -S. And it says how many times can a fire extinguisher be used on small fires? Once. Even the ones in your home. As soon as you squeeze it, it's done. Because after that, a little valve is, is uh, broken, the seal's broken, and then it starts losing pressure. And you need that pressure in the fire extinguisher, so when you do push the button, and uh, you need to rely on that pressure to force the, uh, the components of the fire extinguisher out towards the fire. If that pressure leaves, then you push the button and nothing comes out, and you're in trouble. All right, number four. Emergency gas shut off. Take a look around your own classroom. Obviously, I'm dealing, doing this for all the kids in all different classrooms. So look around your classroom. Um, find it. Who's allowed to push the button? Anyone. Anyone can push that button. Whoever's closest should hit it, and then all the gas shuts off. What precautions should you take personally before you start a lab? Uh, make sure you tie back your hair. You don't want that getting into the fire. You want to re remove any loose clothing, push up sleeves, that kind of stuff. Uh, any jang dangling jewelry doesn't want to get in the way. Make sure your goggles are on correctly, not on top of your head. And you want to understand any of the safety precautions uh, in the lab. Number six, under what conditions should you wear goggles? All the time. Anytime that you have heat, glassware, chemicals, anything like that, you should have goggles on your eyes. Now, in the beginning of the year, we started off looking at different types of equipment. I'm not going to show you here, but you can always go back into your notes and look at what a ring stand looks like, what a beaker looks like, and so forth. Um, and here's the uses. Obviously, a ring stand, we want to be able to support any kind of glassware on top of a Bunsen burner. Uh, beakers will hold your liquids. It's helping. It will help you to estimate volume. We can't because there's so uh, few graduations or few lines on the beaker. We can't use them to make accurate measurements. If we want to make accurate measurements, we would use a graduated cylinder. But this will help us just estimate. A uh, flask, remember, it kind of looks like this. And this is great because the liquids in here can be swirled around without popping out of the top. You try to swirl stuff in a beaker, and it's probably going to splash all over. Pipettes, we use pipettes quite often, and they're used to transfer small amounts of liquid drop by drop. Wire gauze. The wire gauze, remember, sits on top of the ring stand like that, and you can put a beaker or something on top of that. We could also use it to kind of dissipate heat. Um, and we probably use them in the last lab, that, or one of the last labs that you did, when you took a hot uh, dish off of the hot plate, you were able to put it on a wire gauze so it didn't hit the cool counter and possibly shatter. And finally, a triangle. Um, this is used to support a crucible on top of a ring. So again, you put it up here, and then you can put the little crucible inside, and then you can put the flame underneath and really get the flame up and around the sides of the crucible. Uh, number eight, how can you tell if a piece of glassware is hot or not? The deal is you can't. If you look at a piece of glassware, you can't tell if it's hot or not. It looks exactly the same, so you just always want to assume that it's hot. All right, what's the difference between independent and dependent variables? What tricks can you use to remember which is which? Independent starts with an I. This is a variable that you test or you change. So you think, I change this, I test. What do I want to manipulate? And then dependent variable is what you're going to measure that gives you the data that answers your question. So dependent starts with D, data starts with D. For instance, um, one of the examples that I've given in the past is testing out different ski waxes to see which one makes your skis go down the mountain faster. The independent variables will you choose to test. Are you going to choose to test brand A, B, and C? Are you going to choose to test brand A, B, and X? What are you going to choose to test? 
the dependent variable is the data that answers your question. You may measure a lot. You may measure how far the run is going down the mountain. You may measure what the temperature is outside. You may measure uh, what time it is in the morning. You may measure how much wax you put on. Um, you may measure a whole bunch of things, but the one thing that's going to give you the answer to your problem is probably how fast you get down the mountain. So that's going to be your dependent variable. How fast you get down in the mountain depends on the wax that you choose. Is it A, B, C, or X? And then when you graph, you're going to be putting the independent variable down here. Think of this horizontal line as the top of the eye. And then this is the dependent variable. And think of this vertical line as the side of the D. So you could do that. And then, what's the difference between a controlled trial and controlled variables or constants? Well, a controlled trial is a trial that you really don't do anything to. You don't change anything. You just want to collect baseline data. And then you're going to start manipulating things. So, for instance, if I'm dealing with the ski wax issue, I would probably try a run down the mountain without any ski wax and see how fast I get down that way. And then after that, I can put the different ski waxes on and see if that alters my, my time at all. Controlled variables or constants are all the other things that may change that could affect the results. So you have to keep them the same throughout. So I may have to do all the runs down the mountain. If I do some runs and my friend does other runs, then my friend may get down the mountain faster just because they're a better skier, not because they have a better wax. Um, what type of the conditions there are and so forth. Those are all different things that could change the, the results of the experiment. So we have to keep them the same. Number 11. How do you determine whether to make a bar or a line? There's a trick to this. If, hold on a second. All right. If you have unrelated categories, things that don't uh, flow or continue on one right into the other, then it's going to be a bar. If you're compar comparing continuous data or data that runs from one thing right into the next, then it's going to be a line. Now, here's the trick. You draw two dots wherever your data is. So we've got wax A and wax B. And this is how long it takes to get, we'll put time over here. This is how long it takes to get down with wax A, and this is how long it takes to get down with wax B. Now, if you can connect them with a line, that means that every point in between means something. So eeny, meeny, miny, mo, I'm just going to pick that point. I'm going to ask myself, does that mean anything? So if I drew a line and picked that point, does that tell me something significant? Well, it does tell me a time, but does it tell me anything down here? No, there's really nothing in between A and B. There's no continuous ongoing data in between A and B. So this doesn't tell me anything, so I can't have a line. Instead, I have to turn it into two bars. So always ask yourself, can you connect these points? If you do, pick a point on that line and ask yourself, does it mean something to you? And if you get information on both the x and the y axis that makes sense, then keep it aligned. If not, turn it into a bar. And that's it for part one.